Emergent Storytelling Writing words to fit an existing melody and meter, as I did on Everything That Happens and many other records, is something anyone who writes in rhyme does naturally and intuitively. Every rapper improvises or composes to a meter, for example. I had been encouraged to make this process, which is usually internalized, more explicit when I was writing the words for Remain in Light. That was the first time I tackled a whole record of lyrics this way. I found that, remarkably, solving the puzzle of making words and phrases fit existing structures often resulted, somewhat surprisingly, in words that have an emotional consistency and sometimes even a narrative thread even though those aspects of the text weren't planned ahead of time. How does this happen? With Remain in Light, and even before that, I would look for words that fit pre-existing melodic fragments that I or others had come up with. After filling lots of pages with non-sequiturs, I would scan them to see if a lyrically resonant group emerged. Phrases that would hint at the beginning of an actual subject often seemed to want to emerge. This might seem magical, claiming that a text wants to come into being, and we've heard this said before, but it's true. When some phrases, even if collected almost at random, begin to resonate together and appear to be talking about the same thing, it's tempting to claim they have a life of their own. The lyrics may have begun as gibberish, but often, though not always, a story in the broadest sense emerges. Emergent storytelling, one might say. So I begin by improvising a melody over the music. I do this by singing nonsense syllables, but with weirdly inappropriate passion, given that I'm not saying anything. Once I have a wordless melody and a vocal arrangement that my collaborators, if there are any, and I like, I'll begin to transcribe that gibberish as if it were real words. I'll listen carefully to the meaningless vowels and consonants on the recording, and I'll try to understand what that guy me, emoting so forcefully but inscrutably, is actually saying. It's like a forensic exercise. I'll follow the sound of the nonsense syllables as closely as possible. If a melodic phrase of gibberish ends on a high oo sound, then I'll transcribe that, and in selecting actual words, I'll try to choose one that ends in that syllable, or as close to it as I can get. So the transcription process often ends with a page of real words, still fairly random, that sound just like the gibberish. I do that because the difference between an O and an A ah and a B and a TH sound is, I assume, integral to the emotion that the story wants to express. I want to stay true to that unconscious, inarticulate intention. Admittedly, that content has no narrative, or might make no literal sense yet, but it's in there. I can hear it. I can feel it. My job at this stage is to find words that acknowledge and adhere to the sonic and emotional qualities, rather than to ignore and possibly destroy them. Part of what makes words work in a song is how they sound to the ear and feel on the tongue. If they feel right physiologically, if the tongue of the singer and the mirror neurons of the listener resonate with the delicious appropriateness of the words coming out, then that will inevitably trump literal sense although literal sense doesn't hurt. If recent neurological hypotheses regarding mirror neurons are correct, then one could say that we empathetically sing, with both our minds and the neurons that trigger our vocal and diaphragm muscles, when we hear and see someone else singing. In this sense, watching a performance and listening to music is always a participatory activity. The act of putting words down on paper is certainly part of songwriting, but the proof is in seeing how it feels when it's sung. If the sound is untrue, the listener can tell. I try not to prejudge anything that occurs to me at this point in the writing process. I never know if something that sounds stupid at first will, in some soon-to-emerge lyrical context, make the whole thing shine. So no matter how many pages get filled up, I try to turn off the internal sensor. Sometimes sitting at a desk trying to force this doesn't work. I never have writer's block exactly, but sometimes things do slow down. At those times I ask myself if my conscious mind might be thinking too much, 
And it's exactly at this point that I most want and need surprises and weirdness from the depths. Some techniques help in that regard. For instance, I'll carry a micro-recorder and go jogging on the west side, recording phrases that match the song's meter as they occur to me. On the rare occasion that I'm driving a car, I can do the same thing. Are there laws against driving and songwriting? Basically, anything, driving, jogging, swimming, cooking, cycling, that occupies part of the conscious mind and distracts it, works. The idea is to allow the thonic material the freedom it needs to gurgle up, to distract the gatekeepers. Sometimes just a verse, or even a phrase or two, will resonate and be sufficient, and that's enough to unlock the whole thing. From there on, it becomes more like fill-in-the-blank conventional puzzle solving. This particular writing process could also be viewed as a collaboration. A collaboration with oneself, with one's subconscious as well as the collective unconscious, as Jung would put it. As in dreams, it often seems as if a hidden part of oneself, a doppelganger, is attempting to communicate, to impart some important information. When we write, we access different aspects of ourselves, different characters, different parts of our brains and hearts. And then, when they've each had their say, we mentally switch hats, step back from accessing our myriad selves, and take a more distanced and critical view of what we've done. Don't we always work by editing and structuring the outpouring of our many selves? Isn't the end product the result of two or more sides of ourselves working with one another? We've often heard this process described by creative folks as channeling, or just as often people refer to themselves as a conduit for some force that speaks through them. I suspect that the outside entity, the god, the alien, the source, is a part of oneself, and that this kind of creation is about learning how to listen to and collaborate with it.